Change here for trains to Bishop Auckland, Middlesbrough. Hartlepool, a port town 17 miles from Durham and the furthest I've been from my home in Hertfordshire for well over a year. It's known as a place where local people allegedly executed a monkey they mistook for a Frenchman during the Napoleonic War. Yes, really. But it's also the scene of what could be a seismic political battle this coming Thursday, the Hartlepool by-election on Thursday the 6th of May. It was caused when sitting Labour MP Mike Hill resigned. And Labour really have everything to lose. They've held a seat since 1974, but the Tories sent a possible victory. And any win for the Tory party will be a disaster for Keir Starmer and will be a massive boost for Boris Johnson after a difficult few weeks. So I've hopped on a train to County Durham, leaving behind a chaotic week for Boris Johnson's government back in Westminster. A week of leaks, leaks about leaks, and questions about who's paying for the wallpaper in his flat in number 11 Downing Street. I'll be talking to the co-chairman of the Tory party, Amanda Milling, shortly. But first, I wanted to get a sense of what people think about here. I've only ever been to Hartlepool, covering politics, with Nigel Farage, either when he ran UKIP or latterly the Brexit party. This is Brexit country, which is why Farage was always here. So I set off for Hartlepool town centre to buy a cup of coffee and ask local people a few questions. What do you think of Boris Johnson? I think he's brilliant. Have you always voted Tory? No, I used to vote Labour, but they never did anything, so we turned to Tories and I think they've done a good job. What do you think of Boris Johnson? Not a lot. Waste of time, mostly. Tells lies. I'm not a fan, as you can guess. If you were to describe the Tory government in three words, what would they be? <laughs> it's going to sound biased, but I'd say I don't think they've done anything wrong whatsoever in any part of their term in, in power. May I ask, uh, what do you think of Boris Johnson? Um, I think that um, he takes some believing sometimes, yes. Will you vote for him on Thursday? Is he your guy or Labour Party? I won't be voting Labour. And you're... Let's put it that way. Uh, have you previously voted Labour? Uh, in the far distant past. But I have been a Tory voter for the last few elections. And you're not sure on him now, Boris Johnson? Because I'm of what... not sure about Boris Johnson, but I'll be probably vote Tory. Now, Amanda Milling has been the Tory MP for Cannock Chase in Staffordshire. Elected in 2015, she's enjoyed a stellar rise through the ranks in Parliament. Most recently, a whip, and then last year she became co-chairman of the party. Originally a Remainer, she helped organise Boris Johnson's leadership campaign. So we sat down for a cup of coffee and a nice brownie on the seafront here in Headland near Hartlepool to talk politics and whether the Tories really can win on Thursday. Amanda Milling, the chairman of the Tory party, welcome to Chopper's Politics on the road. Thank you very much, Chris. I'm delighted to be on the road here in Hartlepool. What have the Tories ever done for Hartlepool? So I think when you look at what Ben Houchen is, the, the Tees Valley mayor, has done for this region, you can see what a difference Conservative representatives had. He's done a phenomenal job for this area. You know, what he did with the airport, what he's been doing to, to lobby to have, you know, we've got the free port coming to the Tees Valley, which the Port of Hartlepool is part of. You know, he's attracted... Um, Treasury coming to Dar Darlington. So he's been doing a brilliant job to put this part of the country firmly on the map and get that investment, which will create the jobs yeah. and, and investment for the area. Is that understood here? Are people actually seeing the benefits of, 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 of I mean, the tourists have been in power for 11 years now, and are they seeing actual benefit on the ground here? So the work that both Ben Houchin and actually the other new Conservative MPs in this region, they will be seeing that difference. You know, the new MPs in, in some of the seats nearby have made a real difference and they've really hit the ground running. So it's and only if you have an MP you get any benefit from it? From, because for the past 11 years, this place hasn't really benefited from the Tory party, has it? But I think Ben Houchin as the mayor has kind of really put this air on the map. And what I want to see is I want us to get Jill Mortimer elected as the MP for Hartlepool. Because Labour... 
have really taken this seat for granted. It's time for change, change so that she can work with Ben Houchinson, work with government and neighbouring MPs to con continue the investment and in putting this place on the map and being a really strong voice. She's from Yorkshire, isn't she, Jill Mortimer? Why should people from Hartley pull vote for Jill Mortimer? She's just down the road, but also she's got very strong links to, to Hartlepool from kind of her childhood and, and she will be that strong voice for the people of Hartlepool because as I say um, Labour have really left in taking the seat for granted. Mm. It's a big ask isn't it though to have the first ever Tory victory since this seat was created in February 1974 when you and I were just alive I think Amanda. This seat has been Labour for decades now and it, it, it is a bit tall ask. The fact we're even on the pitch and having this discussion is actually pretty <laughs> extraordinary in itself. Um, but we're fighting a really strong campaign to make sure that we uh, get a Conservative elective for the first time in this seat. What is your pitch to them? It's very much about change, making sure that they've got an MP who will put Hartlepool on the map. And also kind of create kind of the jobs and the investment, be a strong voice, apprenticeships. But, you know, I'm working with government, working with government, working with Ben Houchin to make sure that the people of Hartlepool get everything that they need and, and that investment in this area. Are you worried that the levelling up agenda won't be felt in time for people here to vote Conservative on Thursday? When we talk about the levelling up agenda, you can see all around kind of the impact that this is having. And obviously, even despite the pandemic and everything that the government have been doing to kind of tackle the pandemic, we've been delivering on those manifesto commitments that we made. And let's be honest as well, here in Hartlepool, the people of Hartlepool voted overwhelmingly for Brexit. It was the Conservative government that delivered Brexit last year, which will be kind of delivering on the people's priorities of Hartlepool. But that's been done. I mean, the MPs have voted it through this week. The deal is now done. You can't keep talking about Brexit, can you? It demonstrates that we are delivering on our commitments and our promises in the general election. And what I would say about the Labour candidate, this is a candidate who was rejected by the people of Stockton South in the 2019 election. He was going against the wishes of people in this area in terms of Brexit because he was one of the ones who was re wanted a second referendum. He didn't want to, to leave the European Union. And I think people of Hartlepool need to remember that. But of course, we're all now Brexiteers, whether you voted for it or didn't vote for it in 2016. How do you vote for it in 2016? So I voted Remain. Well, but there you are. So what's the problem? No, but I'm very much, I was committed to Brexit. We had a clear vote. But I'm sure this new candidate uh, thinks he is a Labour candidate. But he was trying to overturn the referendum even after the referendum. I was clear we had a clear decision from the country to leave the European Union and very much a Brexiteer. We're all Brexiteers now, apart from Paul Williams. <laughs> OK. How confident are you of victory here on Thursday if you're a betting, a betting woman? This is a very, very tough ask. This is a seat that, as it's been said, has been a Labour seat for decades. We didn't win it in 2019, despite winning seats in the region. But, Jill, we've got a great candidate and we're working really hard to make sure she gets elected on Thursday the 6th of May. And the odds, odds on that? 20% chance of victory? I think the fact that we're actually on the pitch is quite extraordinary. But it's a tall ask to get that kind of the ball in the net. What will the Tory victory mean for the Conservative Party in Hartlepool on Thursday? If we were to win here, that would be a huge victory because, you know, it's been in Labour hands for such a long time. But, you know, we're campaigning hard to make sure that the people of Hartlepool understand the benefits of having a Conservative representative. We've been delivering on the commitments that we made in the 2019 election. We've delivered on Brexit. And all I would say is that Jill Mort is really focused on being a strong voice for the people of Hartlepool. But a win here could be extraordinary for the Tory party, couldn't it? It'd be a, another brick in the red wall that you've been constructing. This is very much a Labour seat and it is Labour's to lose and we're kind of fighting hard to win it. But it has been in Labour hands for a long time. But, you know, this is what the people of Hartlepool, you know, this is about change. This is an opportunity for change and having a strong voice and not being taken for granted. Because after all, the Hartlepool, Hartlepool have been taken for granted for decades by Labour representatives. Do you worry about the minor parties eating into your support? The Reform Party, for example, the Richard Tice's party, they've got a candidate called John Prescott, haven't they? So it's a very long list of candidates that you've got in the by-election. <laughs> what is it, by-elections? By we are, love it. Uh, by-elections, everyone loves it. It's all a bit unpredictable by virtue of having a wide range of candidates. Not least in this particular by-election, you've got three former Labour MPs standing. 
one for the Labour Party, <laughs> another for smaller parties. Right. But you're not worried about these other parties getting involved and getting in the way of you maximising your vote? I think the main thing is, is us getting the message over to people in terms of the benefits of voting for a, a Conservative MP. And the most important poll is obviously the one on the 6th of May next week. Well, on those votes, yeah, quite. I mean, it's a huge... And Maggie, it's a Super Thursday vote, isn't it? I mean, it's two local elections in one. You've got votes across the board in London... Cardiff and Edinburgh. Let's look at local elections first. What are your internal forecasts and how many are going to lose? So this is a really difficult election for us and it's a bumper set of elections. You've got the ones which were postponed from last year as well as the ones which were already scheduled for this year. And you've got the local authorities, you've got police and crime commissioners, you've got the mayoral elections. You've got to remember that many of these elections that we're fighting, we won, gained 550 seats, in fact, in 2017. And that was so, a Brexit local election, wasn't it? That was a Brexit decision, I think, then. That was back in, before the general election of 2017, like you say, just after the referendum. And it, at that point in time, we were 18 points ahead in the polls. And many of those were, you know, we won by a handful of votes here and there and took control of councils by very small majorities. We, you take a look at Lancashire, for instance, we have a majority of two. So it only takes losing a handful of seats to actually lose control of councils as well. Hmm. So it's a big set of elections. It's a tough set of elections for us, but we are fighting really hard. It's been brilliant, from my point of view, to actually get out on the campaign trail. <laughs> Chris, I spent the last 12 months as co-chairman of the party telling people not to go out campaigning. That's not really what the co-chairman should be doing. So I've been thrilled to get actually out across the country only yesterday in the West Midlands, down to Bedfordshire to see our police and crime commissioner candidate there. This is just one day in coming about, about a month now. We're all delighted going... you're delight out and about, Amanda Immeling, but you didn't answer the question at all. What does success look like for the Tory party on, on, on Thursday this coming week? So I think from my point of view, the, the key thing is that this is a defensive election and we need to kind of really minimise the number of seats that we lose across the country. And, you know, we have outperformed in local elections whilst in government. Or alternatively, you could look at it as Labour have underperformed. Corbyn had, well, had the worst record as a leader of the opposition in terms of local elections. And the Lib Dems are starting from a low base as well. So they'll be expecting a revival. So they should all be expecting so you, you, to make gains. 4,000 seats up for grabs, you might lose 1,000. No, I'm not going to get into the numbers uh, of this. You've got them in, I, them in, I, your, in no. your phone, haven't you? Go on to, uh, wait, um, have, let, me, let me have a look. I, I, I'm not going to predictions, but I think for me, you know, it is. You know, we would expect to be losing many seats given where we are, but we've got to fight really hard for those votes and make the case to why people should vote Conservative. Because our record, in contrast to Labour and Lib Dems, in terms of running councils, is so much better. Better value for money. Uh, we, we, in terms of against Labour, we recycle more. In terms of we getting potholes filled. So we've got to... Yeah, our what do you think of councils which are, which are starting to charge for emptying your garden waste? Look, it's up to different councils to make their decisions in terms of what they do. And that's the kind of the case that individual Conservative councils will be making in terms of what are their, their commitments to ensuring value for money and making sure those services are being run effectively. But you mustn't like it. It's pretty annoying, isn't it? You, got, you can't get your rubbish taken away by the local council. Well, and, and this is why Conservative councils have got a great record in terms of being able to kind of provide the, the value for money and the services for their local constituents. Do you think you represent a party of sleaze, Amanda Milling? Absolutely do not feel that we are a party of sleaze. And actually, when it comes to the Labour Party, I won't be taking any lessons from them. You only have to look at, you know, the situation in uh, Liverpool, in Croydon, in Nottingham. And so our key focus as a government, but as a party, is for delivering for the people. The people's priorities is we build back better. We're speaking after number 10 brief that Dominic Cummings was behind some of the leaks which have so damaged the government in, in recent weeks. Why only did it make sense for the government or number 10 or whoever to brief against Dominic Cummings so near to a local election? The Prime Minister and government ministers are wholly focused on kind of delivering for the people as we come out of the pandemic in terms of focused 
on the vaccine rollout. You know, and you have to look at the number of people who've now had their first jab and their second jab. As I go walking around, kind of knocking on doors, the number of people who've actually received their second jab as well. We are totally committed on delivering on the manifesto commitments and also uh, to, to taking us the country out of this kind of pandemic in our kind of cautious and irreversible way. You might be committed to those commitments, of course, but you can't be focused on them because of all this extra noise elsewhere about decorating uh, the number 11 flat, for example, paid for by your members' donations, allegedly. We are totally focused on our kind of role in government in, in terms of, you know, to get you know, the vaccine rollout. But also my focus is in terms of we've got a set of elections coming up next Thursday. And this is about kind of getting more conservative representatives across the country who are delivering for their local areas. Was the work on the flat paid for by the Tory party? The Prime Minister has paid for the refurbishment of the number 10. Uh, flat, number the 11. flat, yeah. Did the party give the money to Boris Johnson to pay for that work? The Conservative Party are not using funds. And actually, we've got a big set of elections coming up. Obviously, the donations that are made to our party are all important in terms of focusing on campaigning. And that is my complete focus. Of course. We have 10 days to go. But a lot of listeners to this, this podcast, readers of The Telegraph that I work for, donate to the Tory party. They want, they want their money to go towards wallpaper in number 11. They want it to go to supporting your work on the ground in Hartlepool. Can you give that guarantee to them? Just yes or so, no? So donations are used for campaigning and that is the key focus of our donations. We've got a big set of elections to fight and that's what our donations are for. Does any of this matter? Is it cutting through? On the doorstep. On the doorstep. People are firmly focused on the issues that, that in terms of, kind of the, their local area. So if I give you an example, I was in Sandwell only yesterday and there was a gentleman talking to, to us about the trees, the road, the speeding. That was his complete focus. And that is my experience being out on the doorstep is that what people really, really care about. And actually, if you think about the last 12 months, we've all been staying at home following the rules. We've really noticed those things. We notice when the bin get collected. We notice those potholes. And, and that's why it matters to them. And that's what that should matter. You, and you think this isn't really cutting through on the doorstep? This is a Westminster bubble story. And, you know, on the ground, it's very much about the, the issues, the local issues that matter to constituents. And from my experience, that's what they're talking to me about on the doorstep. This problem with sleaze that goes back to the 90s that you and I remember, is that damaging the party as far as you can see it? And what's your message to people who might be causing that? Our focus, we you know, when we got elected in 2019, we had a number of different promises. Get Brexit done, we've done that. We had a number of key manifesto commitments in terms of levelling up the country, for instance. I'm actually, when I'm out and about, I see that all the time in terms of the investment in roads, in city centres and town centres. And that is our focus is in terms of getting the job done, delivering on those manifesto commitments. And it's the Conservatives who are doing absolutely that. And Amanda Milling, have you ever heard Boris Johnson talk about not minding seeing bodies piling high if it avoids a second national lockdown due to COVID-19, as was reported in newspapers this past week? I have not. And the Prime Minister has been very clear that he did not say that. And, you know, number 10 have been clear that he did not say that. And this is a man, let's not forget, that this time last year was fighting for his life with coronavirus. And he's been working day and night in fighting this ghastly virus and making sure that we protect jobs and livelihoods and lives. And you only have to look at the way that we've delivered the vaccine rollout in order to be able to protect lives and, and get the country back open once again. And, you know, over the coming weeks, we'll be able to see more restrictions relaxed as the numbers come down, the cases come down, and those vaccines, those jabs go into the arms. All these questions then about what the government did during the COVID crisis are about looking back. When will you finally have this public inquiry into COVID-19? So I think right now we are still in the middle of this pandemic. We're not out of the woods yet. We are continuing the vaccine rollout. We're making great progress um, with that. And we, we are going to start to ease restrictions, but we've got to be acutely aware that we want to avoid cases starting to increase again. So I think it's right that we actually focus right now 
on coming out of this situation, dealing with this ghastly virus. And, and you know, the time will come, but the time we've got to focus on what the job is to, which we need to deal with now. So when is that time? Is it perhaps next year, the year after that? So let's look at, you know, the kind of get to dealing with the immediate situation, which is dealing with the pandemic, continuing with the vaccine rollout, getting people, the country back open again. I think that's what most people are actually focused on. From my experience being on the doorstep, that's what people are really interested in. They want to know that they've got their vaccines, they're getting their vaccines. They want to see the country opening up and getting back to so work. So next year, not all the year after, not, not this year. I, I'm not going to predict when the, this is going to be. My, my main focus is, and the focus of the government is to continue to deal with the pandemic as we face it right now. Uh, and I think, you know, we see that the Labour Party are constantly calling for inquiries. And they were constantly calling, how many inquiries did they call for in the last week? And, you know, we won't be taking any lessons from them. After all, let's take Sir Keir's record on the vaccine task force. One minute he's attacking it, the next minute he's praising it. Looking at the ventilator challenge. OK, OK. One minute he's Well, these saying, are all issues you might come across in a public inquiry and now you're raising them uh, in, in ad hominem hom- yeah, attacks well, against Sir Keir Starmer. Well, Sir Keir is the flip flopping all around okay. in terms of his position on what everything. You, what you can help with then is when will this Islamophobia report be published that the Tory party has done? We're still waiting there, aren't we? So the in, in, independent investigation, I stress independent, is ongoing and it will report in due course. But I think we need to be, you know, it's important that this is done kind of one, for one thing independently, but is done in a very kind of detailed and robust way. And I don't think we should kind of speculate about timings or speeding things up. It's most important for the party that it's, a, it's an independent and a good piece of work. Is it ready yet? Have you seen a draft? So as I say, well, it will be published in due course. It is an independent investigation. I think that we need to remember that. But I look forward to when Professor Singh does provide the report and we'll look at the recommendations. Does the Tory party have a problem with Islamophobia? I don't believe that the uh, party has a, a problem with Islamophobia, but it's important that we undertake this investigation to look at all forms of discrimination because we, we take a zero tolerance approach. But we will, in, you know, we will receive the report in due course and we'll look at the recommendations. We haven't mentioned London yet. Is that because you've given up on the mayoral race, though? So London is, is a tough fight for us. It, all, it always is a tough fight for us. But Everybody we have a fun... tough Monday morning. How is it? Well, you know, it's a You're tough... You're the chairman. You know how hard it is. It's a tough set of elections and I'm getting out around the country, including in London, to get on the campaign trail. We've got an excellent candidate in Sean. I really enjoy being out with him and supporting his campaign. He's not in every cutting way. through in the polls, is he? Look, Sean's doing a great job. He's been had some fantastic hustings where, I have to say, cars look very, very uneasy. Sean is committed to the people of London and taking the campaign out for a fresh start for London. Manuel, any final words here? We're in this, you know, this, this could be, if you win on Thursday, this will be in a moment, won't it? I mean, it will show that it wasn't just a flash in the pan, the 2019 gains and the Red Wall, but, it, but you're building something solid. As I say, this is a very tough election for us, given the history of the seat, but we're taking the fight to Labour. You know, we've had some fantastic wins in kind of seats in, in this area. But look, you know, the fact we're even having this conversation, I find somewhat extraordinary <laughs> given uh, the history of the seats. Um, but, we, we, you know, we're campaigning hard as we're campaigning hard across the country because we've got a lot of battles coming up on Thursday, the 6th of May. And I think my kind of key message is uh, vote Conservative. We want to see Conservative representatives focusing on the people's priorities as we build back better. Amanda Milling in a pub in Hartlepool, thank you for joining us today on Chopper's Politics. Thank you. Very grateful. I'm delighted to be with you in Hartlepool. Amanda Milling there, playing down the chances of a Tory win on Thursday. And well, she might. If the Tories win, it'll be close. But my goodness, the party will be reminded about the electoral power that Boris Johnson can give, almost unique in British politics. And for Labour... Well, the first time they've ever lost a seat since 1974 when it was created. And for Keir Starmer, it'll prompt real questions about his leadership and whether he's really the right man to take the party into the general election. Well, that's enough from me here. I'm freezing cold and so is Theo. Thank you to my producer, Theo Lulidis. Thank you to everyone back at Base Camp. That's Louisa Wells and Edith Lampett. Please do sign up and be a subscriber to The Telegraph. Go to telegraph.co.uk forward slash chopper to get 30 days free access to our best content. 
and always, if you can, buy a copy of the Daily Telegraph. But for me and Theo in a blustery Hartlepool, thanks for listening. And cheerio!